colonization of the English language. The rednecks of these regions were what one social historian has called some of the most disorderly inhabitants of a deeply disordered land. In this world of impotent laws, daily dangers, and lives that could be snuffed out at any moment, the snatching at whatever fleeting pleasures presented themselves was at least understandable. Certainly prudence and long-range planning of one's life had no such payoff in this chaotic world as in more settled and orderly societies under the protection of effective laws. Books, businesses, technology, and science were not the kinds of things likely to be promoted or admired in the world of the rednecks and crackers. Manliness and the forceful projection of that manliness to others, and advertising of one's willingness to fight and even to put one's life on the line, were at least plausible means of gaining whatever measure of security was possible in a lawless region and a violent time. The kinds of attitudes and cultural values produced by centuries of living under such conditions did not disappear very quickly, even when social evolution in North America slowly and almost imperceptibly created a new and different world with different objective prospects. What the rednecks or crackers brought with them across the ocean was a whole constellation of attitudes, values, and behavior patterns that might have made sense in the world in which they had lived for centuries, but which would prove to be counterproductive in the world to which they were going, and counterproductive to the blacks who would live in their midst for centuries before emerging into freedom and migrating to the great urban centers of the United States, taking with them similar values. The cultural values and social patterns prevalent among Southern whites included an aversion to work, proneness to violence, neglect of education, sexual promiscuity, improvidence, drunkenness, lack of entrepreneurship, reckless searches for excitement, lively music and dance, and a style of religious oratory marked by strident rhetoric, unbridled emotions, and flamboyant imagery. This oratorical style carried over into the political oratory of the region in both the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights era and has continued on into our own times among black politicians, preachers, and activists. Touchy pride, vanity, and boastful self-dramatization were also part of this redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. They boast and lack self-restraint, Olmsted said, after observing their descendants in the American antebellum South. While Professor Grady McWhiney's cracker culture is perhaps the most thorough historical study of the values and behavioral patterns of white Southerners, many other scholarly studies have turned up very similar patterns, even when they differed in some ways as to the causes. Professor David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, for example, challenges the Celtic Connection thesis put forth by Professor McWhiney, but shows many of the same cultural patterns among the same people, both in Britain and in the American South. Popular writings of the 19th and 20th centuries have likewise described similar behavior, including the Indianapolis residents' comments on white southern migrants to that city, which sounds so much like what many have said about ghetto blacks. None of this is meant to claim that these patterns have remained rigidly unchanged over the centuries, or that there are literally no differences between whites and blacks in any aspects of this subculture. However, what is remarkable is how pervasive and how close the similarities have been. Pride and Violence Centuries before black pride became a fashionable phrase, there was cracker pride, and it was very much the same kind of pride. It was not pride in any particular achievement or set of behavioral standards or moral principles adhered to. It was instead a touchiness about anything that might be even remotely construed as a personal slight, much less an insult, combined with a willingness to erupt into violence over it. New Englanders were baffled about this kind of pride among crackers. Observing such people, the Yankees could not understand what they had to feel proud about. However, this kind of pride is perhaps best illustrated by an episode reported in Professor McWhiney's Cracker Culture. When an Englishman, tired of waiting for a Southerner to start working on a house he had contracted to build, hired another man to do the job, the enraged Southerner, who considered himself dishonored, vowed, Tomorrow morn I will come with men and twenty rifles 
and I will have your life, or you shall have mine. In the vernacular of our later times, he had been dissed, and he was not going to stand for it, regardless of the consequences for himself or others. The history of the antebellum South is full of episodes showing the same pattern, whether expressed in the highly formalized duels of the aristocracy or in the no-holds-barred style of fighting called rough and tumble among the common folk, a style that included biting off ears and gouging out eyes. It was not simply that particular isolated individuals did such things. Social approval was given to these practices, as illustrated by this episode in the antebellum South. A crowd gathered and arranged itself in an impromptu ring. The contestants were asked if they wished to fight fair or rough and tumble. When they chose rough and tumble, a roar of approval rose from the multitude. This particular fight ended with the loser's nose bitten off, his ears torn off, and both his eyes gouged out, after which the victor himself, maimed and bleeding, was chaired round the grounds to the cheers of the crowd. This rough-and-tumble style of fighting was also popular in the southern highlands of Scotland, where grabbing an opponent's testicles and attempting to castrate him by hand was also an accepted practice. Scottish Highlanders were, in centuries past, part of the Celtic fringe, or North Britons, outside the orbit of English culture, not only as it existed in England, but also in the Scottish lowlands. The Highlanders lagged far behind the Lowlanders in education and economic progress, as well as in the speaking of the English language, for Gaelic was still widely spoken by Highlanders in the 19th century, not only in Scotland itself, but also in North Carolina and in Australia, where immigrants from the Scottish Highlands were unable to communicate with English-speaking people, including Lowland Scots, who had also immigrated. In the Hebrides Islands off Scotland, Gaelic had still not completely died out in the middle of the 20th century. What is important in the pride and violence patterns among rednecks and crackers was not that particular people did particular things at particular times and places, nor is it necessary to attempt to quantify such behavior. What is crucial is that violence growing out of such pride had social approval. As Professor McWhiney pointed out, men often killed and went free in the South, just as in earlier times they had in Ireland and Scotland. As one observer in the South noted, enemies would meet, exchange insults, and one would shoot the other down, professing that he had acted in self-defense because he believed the victim was armed. When such a story was told in court, in a community where it is not a strange thing for men to carry about their person's deadly weapons, each member of the jury feels that he would have done the same thing under similar circumstances, so that in condemning him, they would but condemn themselves. The actions of Southern courts often amazed outsiders, Professor McWhiney said. But what may be even more revealing of widespread attitudes were the cases that never even went to trial. As another study of white Southerners put it, to many rural Southerners, rather than a set of legal statutes, justice remained a matter of societal norms allowing for respect of property rights, individual honor, and a maximum of personal independence. Any violation of this pattern amounted to a breach of justice requiring a specific response from the injured party. Upon learning that a youthful neighbor had approached his wife in an overly friendly manner, Robert Leard of Tangipahoa, Louisiana, promptly tracked the young man down and killed him. Under the Piney Woods Code of Justice, anything less would have invited shame and ridicule upon the Leard family. Intensity of personal pride was connected by Olmsted with the fiend-like street fights of the South. He mentioned an episode of public murder with impunity. A gentleman of veracity, now living in the South, told me that among his friends he had once numbered two young men, who were themselves intimate friends, to one of them, taking offense at some foolish words uttered by the other, challenges him. A large crowd assembled to see the duel, which took place on a piece of prairie ground. The combatants came armed with rifles, and at the first interchange of shots, the challenged man fell disabled by a ball in the thigh. The other, throwing down his rifle, walked toward him, and kneeling by his side, drew a bowie knife and deliberately butchered him. The crowd of bystanders not only permitted this, but the execrable assassin still lives in the community, 
has since married, and, as far as my informant could judge, his social position has been rather advanced than otherwise, from thus dealing with his enemy. Again, what is important here is not the isolated incident itself, but the set of social attitudes which allowed such incidents to take place publicly with impunity, the killer knowing in advance that what he was doing had community approval. Moreover, such attitudes went back for centuries on both sides of the Atlantic, at least among the particular people concerned. During the era when dueling became a pattern among upper-class Americans, between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, it was particularly prevalent in the South. As a social history of the United States noted, of Southern statesmen who rose to prominence after 1790, hardly one can be mentioned who was not involved in a duel.